So today with us, um, today we're speaking with Mahal Prabhu. Actually, Mahal Prabhu is speaking with us. Uh, Mahal Prabhu is a truth seeker for, he has been on this way for more than 45 years. And so he, he is also, um, he's also a, a disciple of such great teachers as uh, Srila Prabhupada, Shidar Maharaj, uh, Govinda Maharaj, and uh, he also is a compiler and author of uh, many spiritual books, and uh, he's also a counselor of the Full Dome Pro in Los Angeles and throughout the whole world. And so he's simply a very, very, very good person, and uh, today he's with us and will tell us, will continue to tell us about um Bhagavad Gita and the ninth chapter. And so I'm turning on the translation and not all the people will hear me. Okay. Dandavad, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh Rajasundari. Um and thank you for joining us, uh, Pranashish Prabhu. Uh, of SOS Press and Praneshwari Devi and uh, Mar Tapanandini and uh, I can't see the other name Ajita Krishna, Ilya Kolesniko. Um, There can be no question of suspending one's study of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, this book is valuable at any time in life. And you will see if you take to heart the study of Bhagavad Gita that you'll get a different reading from it according to where you are in your life and what you're doing. That's what makes it one of the great books. That every time you open the Bhagavad Gita, you will find something to challenge you and something that will give you hope. Uh, we hope. So... Uh, just, I'm going to chant a couple of Hare Krishnas to concentrate my mind. don't want to give a long invocation, so uh, we were trying to read the ninth chapter. I'm reading from uh, Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, uh, and Krishna tells Arjun, idam tu te gu yatamam pravakshyami Anasuyave, Gyanam Vigyanam Sakitam, Yajgatva Mokshise Shubhat. Krishna says, Arjun, because you're never envious of me, uh, I shall impart to you this most confidential knowledge and realization, knowing which you shall be relieved of the miseries of material existence. And here, the words gyan and vigyan are used. So, Srila Sridhar Maharaj in, in his uh, Hidden Treasure of the Sweet Absolute titles this chapter, 
the hidden treasure of devotion. And translates this a little bit differently. He says, now I reveal to you the most hidden treasure of knowledge and pure devotion with direct realization of me. The idea being that if real knowledge does not culminate in love, then it's not real. So many people study the Bhagavad Gita with different motives. Um, we want to calm the mind or become mindful or develop some sort of mystic yoga <laughs> understanding. And uh, <clears throat> we live in the world of exploitation. So mostly the idea is uh, the Bhagavad Gita will be a tool for me so that I can uh, rebalance myself and face the hard struggle for existence again. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're working so hard. <clears throat> and sometimes the stress of work is such that we think I can't do this anymore. I can't go on. So we turn to yoga to give us strength to move on. Same is true of, of religion, meditation, and so many things. But our focus is not on divinity. Our focus is not on self-realization. Our focus is on <clears throat> trying to get by, <clears throat> trying to make some money, <clears throat> on continuing our plan for exploitation. And we want to use Krishna, we want to use the Bhagavad Gita to help us become more powerful or more wealthy. But this is not the true purpose of knowledge. In fact, this is not really uh, knowledge. Uh, but Krishna is telling us here, Raja Vidya Raja Guyam Pavitram idam utamam pratyaksha vagamam dharmyam sushukam kartam avyayam. He says, this particular knowledge that I'm going to teach you now, this is the most secret of all secrets. It's the purest knowledge, and because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion. It is everlasting and it is joyfully performed. So he's saying all this knowledge that you're using for exploitation uh, in this material world is ultimately not the highest kind of knowledge. Uh, but what I'm going to explain here has to do with uh, Krishna Bhakti, which is the highest of all knowledge. So, now this is a point of departure for many people because they don't really like the idea of Krishna. Uh, people who read the Bhagavad Gita don't mind the idea of yoga or concentrating on the self or uh, being able to raise the energy of the life force uh, from the lower chakras to the higher chakras. People have no problem with kundalini yoga because they feel that that will make them more powerful. People have no problem with the idea of karma yoga that uh, do your work in a way that is excellent and try to dedicate that to a higher power. That's not such a bad message for most people. Uh, 
a lot of people believe in a higher power. But they think that the message of the Bhagavad Gita in particular is a sectarian one because it mentions Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now, in other scriptures, Godhead is not really named in this way. Uh, he's given different names, of course, like Jehovah or the All-Powerful One or Allah. But in these different religious conceptions, uh, God has no personal qualities. And so they don't like it when we say, well, Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. But remember, the word Krishna means all attractive, all beautiful. And we think that the idea that God is all beautiful is the best idea. It's better than to think that God is all powerful or that he is the punisher who will punish you for your sins. So, depending on how you read the book, of course, uh, the message of the Bhagavad Gita is not an exclusive or a sectarian message. Really, it's an inclusive message. It's meant to be uplifting to everyone. So when, for example, Krishna says that the the Atma, the soul, is eternal. He's not saying that you only have a soul if you're a Hindu. <clears throat> he doesn't make any reference to a Christian or a Jewish or a Muslim or Hindu soul. There's no national distinction made. There's no such thing as an American soul versus a Russian soul or a Ukrainian soul versus an Arabic soul. Krishna explains that the principles of karma, action, and reaction, they're equal for all souls. You engage in bad karma and go down. You follow the simple ideas of compassion, purity, mercy, honesty, austerity, and consciousness will be purified, no matter your social class or religious principles. But here in the ninth chapter, he's saying, go deeper, uh, take it to a higher level, discover bhakti, dive deep into reality. Krishna points out that those who are unable to do the hard work of humility and dedication are doomed to accept lesser principles, lesser religious ideas like uh, nationalism or patriotism or humanism, and on account of a lack of self-realization, they identify these as the highest truth. And Krishna points out, they'll, they'll never really understand the ideals of Krishna Bhakti as described in this chapter. So that's why Krishna Bhakti is a big secret. It's kind of an open secret. It means you know that this is the truth. And yet, you're always looking for something different, something easier. Instead of surrendering to Krishna, I'll become a, a Vedic scholar or an astrologer, or <clears throat> I'll eat really healthy green food and be a vegan. And these are all worthy practices, but we're avoiding the real truth, the hard truth, which is surrender. And um, another reason why you could say that this message of the Bhagavad Gita is secret or it's hidden, it's Rajaguya, is because nominally the Mahabharata is a book about war. So you, if you'd like to start an argument with someone in India, uh, start talking about the Mahabharata and then take sides. You can say, well, Arjuna is better than Karna. And they will say, no, no, Karna is better than Arjuna. Why? Because he's courageous. Arjuna, look at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. He's cowardly. He doesn't want to fight. Karna is the real hero. 
So any discussion of the Mahabharata, which involves itself with war, will turn into a sort of a political discussion. But that misses uh, the real point. Uh, the Mahabharata is a book about war and hate. But hidden within the pages of this book of war and hate between the members of the same family, and this is a war that changed India forever, uh, lost perhaps in the pages of the story of blood and struggle is, is a big secret. And this is the secret of perfect peace. So apparently the Mahabharata is a book about war, but embedded in that book are these deep truths like the Upanishads. The Upanishads are dialogues and conversations about the soul, about eternal truth. But these secrets are lost as soon as we get involved in ego, uh, as soon as we fall prey to anger and pride and allow ourselves to be driven by anger. These hidden truths disappear as soon as we follow the politics of hate, of envy, of lust and personal motives. And right now in the world, uh, most politics tend toward hate. And this follows the logic of divine uh, divide and conquer. If you're not with me, you're against me. And even people who have the same self-interest are divided by these petty ideas of hate. Uh, Nietzsche pointed out that much of philosophy is what he called self-interested. It means a philosopher develops a system based on what's good for him. A businessman sees the world in terms of money. Uh, the king sees the world in terms of his kingdom. Um, a womanizer sees the world in terms of sex. But these are all superficial ideas about self-interest. Obviously, our real self-interest is the self, the Atma, the soul. And above that, the Paramatma. And on a higher level, dedication to Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the Mahabharata is such a great story. It's, it's such a fascinating story of the heroes of ancient India that sometimes we lose the truth of the Upanishads, which run through the length and breadth of the Mahabharata. Uh, the Gita is known as Gita Upanishad. Even the great personalities of the Mahabharata fail to hear that truth. Uh, after all, Duryodhan, who is ambitious for kingdom, he's advised by Vidura, he's advised by Markandeya Rishi, many other seers of the truth, but he's blinded by ambition. Uh, Bhima, Arjun, Yudhishthira, they listen to all these different rishis, munis, and Vedic seers. Krishna himself comes to Duryodhan and sues for peace. And yet, even after hearing from all these great seers of the truth, war is in, it's inevitable. They they don't see this hidden message of the Gita, the Raja Vidya, Raja Guya. So when we know what the right thing is and we fail to follow it, we could say that the truth is hidden, that it's a secret. We hold the key in our hands, yet we fail to use it. Bhagavad Gita instructs us in the truth, but are we qualified to hear it? Sometimes we don't have the samskaras. We need to purify ourselves. Uh, Krishna says, pavitram uh, idam utamam. This is the purest thing. But how can you understand the purest thing if your heart is full of lies and hate and ego? And the haters are always making war. 
were shocked and astonished to see war going on. But think about it. Uh, is, is it any wonder that in countries where slaughterhouses murder millions of animals, innocent animals every day, is it any surprise that meat eaters turn upon themselves and violently slaughter each other? Uh, we live in a culture of violence where people kill animals and eat them and comment on how juicy and delicious the blood is. And then uh, work in factories where they produce arms and weapons for mass destruction, murder, and killing. And then spend their, their free time watching violent movies about superheroes, uh, uh, ordinary heroes who go out and kill hundreds of people. So is it any surprise that at, at some point uh, these meat eaters who are filled with violent fantasies turn upon themselves and violently slaughter each other? So where drunken, drunken behavior and violent sport are celebrated, is it any wonder that murderous weapons are forged for slaughtering innocent women and children? So then how are we to resist the haters? And this is an important point because sometimes devotees get caught up in these different arguments and they support one hater against another hater. But we need to remember that devotees are very special souls. Only one in a million people are really interested in Krishna consciousness and of them, how many take it seriously. So this is why Vaishnava Aparad is one of the most terrible of all the different offenses against the holy name of Krishna. Uh, we, we should remember that in 16th century Bengal, the local leaders tried to eliminate the Sankirtan movement uh, because it was seen as a dangerous thing by the king Hussein Shah. And Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, being very generous, he doesn't mention this, but history records that the Shah marched on Jagannath Puri, and his goal was to burn the deities of the Jagannath temple and repress the Hindus. Uh, so how did Haridas Thakur, who was our Namacharya, how did he resist the Muslim authorities of the time? He did so with the purity of, of the holy name of Krishna. He resisted with humility and tolerance. And when the Qazi and King Hussein uh, were confronted by the saintly power of the Harinamacharya, they were astonished. <clears throat> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself led a kirtan with the pounding of drums and the chanting of the holy name to the house of the Qazi. And Vrindavan Das records that the Kasi was visited by none other than Nisringadev himself. And impressed by the divinity of the saintly devotees, King Hussain changed his mind. And he decided to leave the devotees in peace. And he proclaimed that the Sankirtan movement would be untouched by any future regime in Bengal. Now, we don't have the power of Haridas Thakur, we're not on the same level of sainthood. But in understanding the message of the Bhagavad Gita in modern times, we've been advised to follow the example of Haridas Thakur. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us humility and tolerance. And it's fine to be humble in the temple when you're surrounded by saints or to be tolerant when somebody doesn't call you Maharaj or Prabhu, and you think, well, they don't understand my greatness. Uh, I will tolerate. But real tolerance 
real humility is proven in the face of adversity. And the proper exercise of Trinada P, Sunichena, Tarora P, Sahishna Nuna is really found in compassion and compassion for others. Everyone is suffering in this material world. The devotees can see that suffering. The great avatar of compassion was Nityananda Prabhu. Uh, Nityananda Prabhu taught compassion to all of us. Uh, Sri Chaitanya Nityananda taught that the power of the holy name of Krishna is available to all. So there's no question of nationalism or caste superiority or inferiority. As Srila Prabhupada created the the Hare Krishna movement, the International Society of Krishna Consciousness in the 1960s to extend the compassion of Nityananda Prabhu all over the world. So this is something that always inspires me. Of course, I'm old now, and you can think, well, he's an old man. He doesn't understand things. Uh, old people always sue for peace. And young people who have energy, they like the idea of uh, war and killing and combat. It's fun. Uh, but I remember back in the 1960s, I joined the temple in Los Angeles, California. It was a big temple. We had about 500 or 600 devotees. We took over an entire city block of uh, Culver City. And I saw devotees of all shades and colors uh, joining together in peace and harmony to take the holy name to the streets. Uh, every Friday night, the whole temple would get out and we would load ourselves in a few school buses and we would drive out to Hollywood because Friday night in Hollywood were thousands of people walking around trying to find out where's the action. So we would set up there and chant the holy name to the beating of the Murdunga and the clash of cartels. And there were Mexican devotees chanting next to the gringos, black devotees, Jewish devotees, Indian, Hindu devotees. We had Australian swamis, uh, folks from all over the world. Uh, and I remember when I went to India on pilgrimage after Srila Prabhupada's disappearance in 1978, <clears throat> I met devotees from Palestine, <clears throat> devotees who were with the PLO formerly. Uh, I met Israeli devotees. I met devotees from Iraq, Iran, uh, Colombian devotees who'd been with the secret police, <clears throat> German devotees, English devotees, Argentinian devotees, Venezuelan devotees, Brazilian devotees. There were people from everywhere. We spoke English, Spanish, Hindi, Bengali, Sanskrit. There was no distinction made on the base of one's class, color, nationality. We were all united by one idea, and that was that Harinama, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nasteva, Nasteva, Nasteva Gatiranyata. That in this age of darkness, this age of destruction and sadness, this Kali Yuga, the Iron Age, the holy name of Krishna would save our souls. And I loved that idea back in the 1960s. And I still love it today. And so Krishna is telling us that divine love, this is the hidden truth. This is the hidden treasure of the Bhagavad Gita. You won't find it easily. The path of love is not as easy as it seems. It's not paved with rose petals. Love implies sacrifice, humility, tolerance, Respect and compassion for others. Uh, and, and these are lots of nice words. You have to look within your soul to find their meaning. Uh, 
Uh, so this is the true path to peace. Buddha is interested in peace. But in Krishna consciousness, we go beyond peace to discover ananda, ecstasy. And so here, when Krishna says jnana and vijnana, Chakravarti Thakur and the other commentators on the Gita point out that this jnana and vijnana, or uh, knowledge and practical knowledge, uh, culminate in love. And so how do we reach that love? Krishna gives us a hint in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. But another way to look at love <clears throat> is that it's possible through surrender. And Krishna tells Arjuna later, surrender to me. So Srila Sridharmarsh wrote a very interesting book. It's called the Prapana Jivanamrita. And the word prapana means surrender. Jiva is the soul, and amrita is an interesting word. Amrita really sort of derives from the word mrita, mrityu, muerte, mort, mortal. It means death. And amrita, it means immortal. But it's curious that in the seventh canto, or the eighth, in the eighth canto of the Bhagavatam, uh, the fight between the demons and the gods is described, where they decide to resolve their fight with a tug of war, and they use the serpent Vasuki to churn milk out of the ocean of milk and make it into nectar, amrita. So this word amrita also means nectar. <clears throat> it has a double sense. The idea is that the, <clears throat> the nectar uh, of the gods imparts immortality. Uh, so this idea of a kind of medicine or tonic or nectar, which gives immortality. This is found in the word amrita. And what Sri Dharmaraj is saying is that if you want to taste nectar, Srinvantu Vishve Amritasya Putra, oh, you sons of nectar, you were born for nectar. You should not be satisfied with anything less than nectar. So search for Sri Krishna. Uh, but nectar, amrita, also means immortality. So you should not be satisfied with anything less than immortality. We live in a mortal world, a world of death. People are dying everywhere all the time. But the soul does not die. The soul is eternal. So what does that mean? What is immortality for the soul? And Srila Sridhar used to call that positive and progressive immortality. Because if you think of the word mrityu, well then amritya would be the opposite, non-death. But to say non-death, it's not really a positive de uh, definition. Uh, what happens with non-death? Uh, it's just sort of a void. It's like the void of Buddha but with the, the eternal spirit of Shankara. But even that, it's a weak idea. So what does that mean, really? What is Jivanamrita? What is positive and progressive immortality for the soul? Well, it's found in prapana, or surrender. <clears throat> and some people look at the idea of surrender as a process. It's a technique. So you do this, and you do this, and you do this. You become a surrendered soul, and then Krishna gives you everything. But this is superficial, because surrender is its own reward. Surrender is positive and progressive 
immortality. So in this book by Sri Dharmaj, he, uh, he gives us some ideas about surrender. He says, for example, Ahankritir ma karasyam na karas tan nishedaka. He says, if we think of surrender as giving up the ego, uh, the first thing in giving up the ego is the practice of namaha. Namaha is what you say when you offer obeisances or respect. So the symbol ma, it means the ego, and na uh, negates the ego. So when you say namaha, you're negating the ego. And ahankara nivritanam keshavo nahi duraka, ahankara yutanam hi madhye parvatarasaya. He's, uh, Sri Dharmaraj points out that the only real obstacle to surrender is ego. So I have the ego that I'm a man. I have the ego that I'm American. I have the ego that I'm a Catholic. I have the ego that I'm a, uh, a good worker. But all these things are obstacles to surrender. And Krishna remains in the company of, of persons who are free from a mundane conception of life, uh, who can give up the ego. Now, giving up the ego doesn't mean that uh, I commit suicide or destroy uh, the ego. It means I discover my real ego through surrender. And... Uh, Sri Dharmaraj continues, he says, after wandering through 8,400,000 different species, the soul eventually takes a human birth. But that birth is rendered worthless by those who are so proud of their bodies that they refuse to surrender. On the other hand, he says, Sarvachara vivarjita satadiyo vratya jagat vanchaka from the Nisringa Purana. He says, even people who are devoid of all virtuous practices, who are outcast rogues, deceitful, audacious, egoistic, addicted to intoxicants, hotbeds of sin, malicious, cruel hearted, grossly infatuated, with son, wife, wealth, and so on. Even such extremely fallen persons are liberated by surrendering to the lotus feet of Sri Govinda. Sri Govinda is the origin of all the universes, the supreme truth and the shelter of all. One who surrenders unto his lotus feet will never be cast aside. Uh, in the Shanti Parva, Ya enam sangshrayanti bhakya narayanam harim. O king, what more can I say? Those who devotedly take full refuge in Sri Hari cross over this insurmountable ocean of material existence. No trace of apprehension remains for those who take shelter in him they qualify for positive immortality. And then in the Brihad Naradiya Purana, Sangshare Smin Mahagore Moha Nidra Samakule Ye Harim Sharanam Janti Te Kritarta Na Sangshaya In the dense darkness of this material world which is engulfed in ignorance and darkness, those who surrender to the holy name of, of the holy lotus feet of Krishna are successful in all their endeavors. Of this, there is no doubt. 
Of course, when it says all their endeavors, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can go to Las Vegas and put all your money on Lucky Seven and you'll become rich. But what we're talking about, again, is your, your true self-interest, the interests of the soul. Krishna is Hari. Hari is one who takes away. We may need to lose everything before we gain uh, everything. But if we have faith in what the Shastra says, if we have faith in what Krishna says, then we should know that he carries what we lack and preserves what we have. In the Bhagavatam, Yesham Saeva Bhagavan Dayayed Ananta Sarvat Manashrita Pado Jadi Nirvyalika. He says that the illusion of bodily identification and mundane possessiveness is dispelled for the surrendered soul due to taking shelter of his lotus feet. Then there's unreserved grace, unreserved mercy. And through this, we will surpass the insurmountable illusory energy of the Lord. On the other hand, Krishna does not favor those who believe in the idea of I and mine. So sometimes it takes a disaster for us to realize that the body is not the important thing. Uh, it's nice to have material possessions. It's nice to have a computer like this one or Zoom and to be able to talk to people all over the world. It's just a great luxury. Nice to have beautiful clothes. But in the end, we can't take any of this with us. It's not our real self-interest to serve uh, the material world. It says I've been signed out. I, I got a notice from Zoom, just as I said that, that I'm being signed out because I was signed in to another device, but it looks like I'm still here. So, Here's another one. O oh, Nisringade, O oh, Almighty Lord, precautions and remedies are only short lived when attempted by the suffering of embodied souls. Parents are not the guardians of their children. Medicine is not the cure for the diseased. And a boat is not the savior of a man drowning in the ocean. This is because, after all, these things are temporary. Medicine is not the cure for the disease. You can have all the vaccines you like, but in the end, you have to die, just like everyone else. Uh, the parents believe they're the guardians of, of the children, but sometimes we're very disappointed. Our children find other guardians. They reject the advice of their parents, and in the end, parents die, children die, we're all swept away. So then Krishna says here in the Bhagavad Gita, coming back to my, my text, because I want to move through this chapter, Sarva Bhutani Konteya Prakritim Janti Mamikam Kalpakshaye Punastani Kalpado Visrajami Aham. Krishna says at the end of the millennium, all material manifestations enter into my nature. And at the beginning of another millennium, by my potency, I create them again. So what to speak of, you know, Hiroshima or one nuclear explosion or the destruction of my city? I saw on the news that in Australia, one of my friends, Madhura Krishna Prabhu, his house was inundated by a terrible flood, which is sweeping away. Uh, so many houses and buildings, and people are underwater. Uh, so there's all these 
little destructions constantly going on all over the world. And in the end, Krishna says, uh, I'm going to absorb all the universes. They're all going to destroy. Even if you can live for a thousand years or a million years. In the end, the whole cosmic order is under me. Under my will, it is automatically manifested again and again. And under my will, it is annihilated in the end. So if this material world is like a prison house, uh, you can try to make a very beautiful prison house. Pablo Escobar in Colombia had millions of dollars, and he converted his prison house into a palatial home. And his girlfriends could come and go, and he ate gourmet food and was visited by his family and had a nice dog, but he was still in prison. So the idea is not to try to create a beautiful prison, but to live, leave this prison house behind and discover what is positive and progressive immortality for the soul. And this is a hard message, but this is real compassion. If we have compassion for others, then we can do a few things. Try not to make their life more miserable. Try not to uh, make other people suffer, especially devotees. Don't make the other devotees suffer. Uh, here in Mexico, there's a big rivalry between two football teams, Chivas and America. So uh, one of my wife's uncles has a small apartment in Mexico City where he lives with his son, who is going to law school. And in the son's room, it's decorated with flags and T-shirts from one football team. And in his father's room, it's the other football team. And those football teams, they hate each other. Uh, but if you pray to God and you say, oh, please let my football team win the game. And then your son is praying for another football team. Which football team is God going to support? Does he have to think, no, I like America, or no, I like Chivas, or I like Dynamo, or, you know, I don't know, Barcelona. No, this is a very superficial idea of how reality works. We are eternal spirit souls. So, especially when it comes to other devotees, we need to avoid uh, criticizing them for their color or how tall they are, or how fat they are, how short they are, or their national origin, or the religion of their parents. Uh, don't increase the suffering of others. This is compassion. But above, and that's kind of a Buddhistic idea, above not creating problems for other people, higher than that, is trying to inspire them about the holy name of Krishna, but you can't force that on people. And if they don't want that and they don't like it, uh, don't, don't push them, even if you think, well, this is for their benefit. Because in the end, uh, it will only cause more suffering. Krishna says, in regard to those who are unable to accept these teachings, he says, avajananti mam mudha. They're fools. The word mudha is interesting because it means burro or ass or donkey. And here in Mexico, if a student is recalcitrant and doesn't want to study, uh, it's popular to say that he's a burro, he's a donkey, because the donkey has his own idea. Uh, you want to move him north, and he wants to go west. So no amount of argument or pulling is going to convince the donkey. He's just going to sit there unmoved. And that's what Krishna is saying. Don't try to push the holy name on people who are completely unqualified for it. You can show them, this is what I have. I'm very fortunate. I have the holy name. 
It's liberating. It's ecstatic. Try it. I remember I was in Petersburg in Russia with Abhidut Maharaj uh, giving a talk to the devotees on John Mastami. And they're all very beautiful devotees or very sweet devotees like Prithu and uh, Dandi Maharaj was there. And I started giving a talk about Prithviche Ateyata Nagaradi Gram Sarvata Prachara Hoi Be Moranam. In every town and village all over the world, people will chant the holy name of Krishna and Goranga, Gora Hari, Gora Hari. And after I finished the talk, Abhidut Maharaj came to me and he said, That was a great talk, Mahari. It was really, you know, really great talk. Love your talk. So excellent. But very 1970s. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean 1970s? That was, you know, that's how we preach, isn't it? I told them, you know, go out, find someone else, ask them to chant Hare Krishna. And you'll see there's a ripple effect. If you can get two people to chant Hare Krishna, and they can get two people to chant Hare Krishna pretty soon. We'll take over the world. And Abhidur Maharaj just shook his head and said, you know, that, that was good preaching back in the 70s, but we don't preach like that anymore. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's better to tell people, look, we have a good thing. Uh, you're invited to participate with us. And if you like it, tell some other people. But we're not trying to preach to people against their will. Uh, it was uh, uh, Carnegie who said, Dale Carnegie, he said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So if you push someone and push someone to try to believe in anything, you'll get resistance. So I, I thought she's got a good point, Abhidut Maharaj. And really, I see myself more as a teacher than a preacher. A teacher helps you to become empowered. A teacher helps you to move a little bit further along the path that you have chosen. Whereas a preacher tries to uh, change your mind convince you, uh, persuade you, move you from one point to the next. And uh, over the years, I've developed myself more as a teacher than as a, a preacher, and I find it more satisfying. But Krishna says, fools deride me, mudha. They deride me when I descend in the human form. They do not know my transcendental nature as the supreme Lord of all that be. Mogasha. This is a good word, moha, moga. It means illusion. Mogasha, moga karmano, moga jnana vichetasa, rakshasim asurim chaiva, prakritim mohinim shrita. Those who are thus bewildered are attracted by demonic and atheistic views. So then people will say, well, why should I worship Krishna? After all, who is Krishna? He does all these tricky things. Uh, I can't see him as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, why should God be a person anyway? If God is a person, why is he such a bad person? Uh, why, why did he create the lion and the tiger? What was he thinking? If God is real, then why do my children suffer? Why do I suffer? Why me, God? So there, there are all these different atheistic views. If God is so powerful, can he make a rock that he can't move? Uh, if God can do anything, can he commit suicide? But these are just sort of faithless, atheistic uh, ideas. In reality, we know 
that the soul is self-evident. If you think about who I am, you should come to the conclusion that you are more than blood and bone. Living things, a tree is more than wood. How is it possible that a tree grows? I'm teaching my students in the school now to uh, germinate seeds. I love to do that. So we have flowers, happy flowers, <laughs> happy flowers. So I'm teaching them, you take a little bit of, of earth and you put some water in the earth and then you put the seed and then cover it a little bit. Tomorrow, put a little more water and uh, soon you will have flowers. How does that work? That's a miracle. We don't know how that works. Ask any scientist and they'll give you these ideas about, well, there's cell mitosis and the cells double. Yeah, but if I, what happens if I fry the seeds? I put the seeds in the microwave of it. I, I expose the seeds to radiation. Then when I plant them, they won't germinate because they're dead. But how can it, what's the difference between a live seed and a dead seed? How can that be? Well, there is a difference, isn't there? So the material ingredients of this universe uh, are not enough to explain reality. We need some formula to explain consciousness. Because without consciousness, there's no universe. Without consciousness, there's no biology. The seed won't grow. How do we explain that? Read the Bhagavad Gita. It's very clear. The soul is eternal. The Atma is real. So if that is not self-evident to you, no amount of argument will really move you. And if it is self-evident, then you can conclude above the Atma, there's a Paramatma. There's hierarchy everywhere. There's higher and lower. There must be a supreme soul. God exists. And what kind of God is he? Well, Krishna is telling you. He's a personal God. But even after all that argument and all that self-evident truth, uh, people can't see it. And so they're bewildered. Moga karmano, moga jnana vichetasaha. They're bewildered and they're attracted by moga jnana, illusory knowledge, virtual knowledge, the matrix. <laughs> In that deluded condition, their hopes for liberation, their karma, their fruitive activities, their culture of knowledge, it's all defeated. And Krishna uses the word rakshasa here. So rakshasa, it means like a man eating demon or cow eating demons. So if you're so determined to exploit the material energy that you want to kill for your, to slake your appetite, uh, to eat meat, to drink blood, to become intoxicated with alcohol and all kinds of other drugs, and then bewilder yourself with uh, sexual fun to the point where you don't know anything and you don't care about anything, then of course your culture of knowledge will be false and defeated. Your knowledge will be the knowledge of how to destroy things how to exploit, how to steal, how to commit fraud. On the other hand, Krishna gives a description of the Mahatma. Uh, the Mahatma means the great soul. That's all of you. 
all of you are Mahatmas, you're all great souls, not because you're listening to me, but you're listening to me trying to think, okay, what does he say about Krishna? Forget this stuff about the school. And, you know, he talked about Mexico and football teams or something, but where's the real nectar here? So those are the Mahatmas, like the Chataka bird. There's a bird in India who it doesn't matter if there's crystal pure water of a mountain lake, the Chataka bird will not touch it. The Chataka bird only looks to the sky and will drink drops of water from heaven. And so you were like those Chataka birds trying to extract some useful nectar from my words. And Krishna says, Mahatmanas to Mamparta, Daivim Prakritim Ashritaha, Bhajanti Ananya Manaso, Gatva Bhutarim Avyaya. He says, Oh, son of Prita, those who are not deluded, the great souls, the Mahatmas, they're under the protection of the divine nature. They are fully engaged in devotional service. So, bhajanti ananya manaso. Um, ananya means undivided. Because they know me as the supreme personality of Godhead, original and inexhaustible. So the Mahatma does not divert his attention to anything outside Krishna, because he knows perfectly well that Krishna is the original supreme person, the cause of all causes. Such a Mahatma or great soul develops through association with other Mahatmas, pure devotees. So we develop with, with this association. Uh, Perhaps you think, well, I'm not a pure devotee, but the association of other devotees gives us hope, gives us strength, helps us to feel that it is, as Srila Sridharmarsh used to say, Om. It means it's a, a big yes. What you're, what you're hoping about, what you're thinking, that there is a divine, there's a power greater than me, it is. You can hear that in the syllable Om. If you're quiet, you sit in a lonely place and you hear the, the sound of the wind or the music of the spheres, you can hear the sound Om. And that's the divine sound reassuring you, yes, there's something greater than you, it is. But even better is the association of other devotees because we can ask someone, uh, we can ask Prajasundari or Anantashesh or Tapanandini or uh, Pranashish or Vrindavan Chandra. Did you see Sridhar Maharaj? Did you see Govinda Maharaj? Did you see Prabhupada? Did you know him? And they'll say, yes, I knew him. I saw there was light. The light came through my, my Guru Dev. The light came through my spiritual master. It's real. And then we have faith, even uh, while the bombs are dropping, even while we're surrounded by uh, corruption and Kali Yuga and the slings and arrows of material existence all around us, the hard struggle for uh, a life. We, we see, yes, it is, it's true, it's there. And that will inspire us. So it's very important to try to keep our friends close, to try to keep our spiritual association together, even if we're in different countries with different faces or we're old or we're young, uh, try to hang on to this association and get some shelter from the, the Mahatmas. And then you, you be a Mahatma. Satatam kirtayanto mam yatantas cha dridhavrata. Always chanting my glories, endeavoring with great interpretation, uh, with great determination, bowing down before me. These great souls perpetually worship me with devotion. So 
Here in the ninth chapter, Krishna really lets it go. And he says, Satatam Kirtayanto Mam. There it is. Do Kirtan. Do Krishna Kirtan. You'll find it, it will warm your heart. It will uh, help you get through the bad times. I broke a tooth yesterday. I had to see the, the dentist. And it was very painful for me. But mentally, I, he didn't give me an, any anesthetic because here in Mexico, anesthetic is expensive. So while he's drilling and I'm feeling the pain, I'm thinking of Krishna. I'm, I'm thinking, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Om Bhur Bhuva Svatat Savitur Varanyam. Bargo de Vasilimihidio, Yona Prachodia. There's a higher thing. There's a higher land. It's available to us. And by singing the glories of Krishna in, in the style of Gauranga and Nityananda, we can transcend this mortal world of, of suffering. And so, in this, it's, and it's not just a question of transcending our own suffering and becoming liberated but by transmitting to this uh, by transmitting this to others uh, there's also great joy to be felt even at the expense of our own suffering look at jesus christ he gave everything to this world to save others why did he do that because there's a certain joy to be had in compassion so when we doubt ourselves. And when we think of the murderous demons who are destroying the world around us, uh, we will find it. But by being compassionate to others, we will experience joy. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur did not particularly care for uh, charity organizations. That's true. But at the same time, the devotees are not inhuman. So we try to lift others up with the, with the nectar of the holy name. But if you see someone worse off than yourself, uh, you can try to lift them up a little bit to help the, help the children, save the children. Uh, Then, he, you know, Krishna, he's always going, he's always giving a little something to those who don't want to surrender. So that's why people like the Bhagavad Gita also, because it's sort of graduated. It has levels. If you teach some, if you teach something to somebody, you have to give them the baby steps first and then teach them to run. So, Jnana Jagena Chapyanye. Yajanto mamupasate, ekatvena pritakvena, bakuda vishvato mukam. He says, others who engage in sacrifice by the cultivation of knowledge worship the Supreme Lord as the one without a second, as diverse in many and in the universal form. So he's 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 saying it's all right. If you can think of God as the almighty, all-powerful, uh, there are these other different levels and different conceptions of God. That's all right. If you can't attain to Krishna Bhakti immediately, aham kratur aham jagya, shraddhaham aham oshadam, mantraham aham evagyam, aham agnir aham hutam. He says, but... It is I who am the ritual, I the sacrifice, the offering to the ancestors, the healing herb, the transcendental chant. I am the butter and the fire and the offering. I'm the father of this universe, the mother, the support and the grandsire. I'm the object of knowledge, the purifier and the syllable om. It is a big yes. I am also the Rig, the Sama, and the Yajur Vedas. 
I am the goal, the sustainer, the master, the witness, the abode, the refuge, and the most dear friend. I am the creation and the annihilation, the basis for everything, the resting place, and the eternal seed. So let's leave it there. I tried to make a little progress with the ninth chapter. The ninth chapter is a very beautiful chapter in the Bhagavad Gita. It's full of bhakti, it's full of inspiration. <clears throat> and we can read it again and again with the commentaries and never reach the limit because every verse in the Bhagavad Gita is infinite. Every verse in the Bhagavad Gita contains the meaning of the entire Gita, the meaning of all the Mahabharata and the Upanishads. And um, so I leave that with you for contemplation. And thank you all very much for allowing me to speak a few words on Bhagavad Gita even during difficult times. So, Agyana Tamaranda Syagiranjana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Jaina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Gora Haribo, Gora Haribo, Gora Haribo, Gora Haribo. Any questions? It says in the it says in the advertisement for this talk that I'm taking questions, but I haven't really been taking any questions. But questions imply confidence. And uh, it's hard to ask somebody a question if you don't really believe anything they're saying. If you think, ah, this guy, who is he, you know? <laughs> Why should I listen to this? But it's nice to have a question or two just to interact with people and know that you're still out there. Maybe I won't answer the question, but you can try. Nandavats Prabhu. Nandavats, Ajita Krishna does. I just want, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say I really appreciate the talk today. It was very inspiring and very nice and clearly delivered, and I just wanted to say I appreciate you. Dandavats, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Where are you, Ajita Krishna? Where are you calling from? I'm in California. I'm about six hours north of Sokhil Ashram. Okay, that would be California. like Mount Shasta, Redding? Actually, Mendocino County. Mendocino, okay. Yeah. My brother's a truck driver. He drives from Fresno up to uh, Seattle, Washington uh, once a week and then back down. Uh, a couple of years back, uh, I joined him. I wanted to visit him. I hadn't seen my brother in 35 years because I spent so much time as a Hare Krishna, sort of neglected my family. But my mother died, and I thought, well, I should see my brother. And he said, well, I don't have a house, but you can join me in my truck. So we trucked up north of Mendocino and then back down. I don't think we, we touched Mendocino County because that's, that's more in the valley, isn't it? It's more towards the coast from the five. Like you guys probably went up the high five. And that's we're right. towards the 101, past, past right. the 101 towards the coast. I'm right on the coast. Yeah. Yeah. I told him, hey, we should go over to the coast. And he said, I can't because I have uh, GPS tracking. And if I get off the five, I will be punished by the law. <laughs> oh, yeah. Big Brother's anyway. watching. Yeah, really. But anyways, uh, thank you so much for hanging in with us and, and uh, giving a little support. The thing is, when I look out there and I see all these Mahatmas, I think I, I really have to work hard to try to represent uh, the truth as it was spoken by Prabhupada and Sridhar Maharaj and Govinda Maharaj, and avoid saying anything uh, wrong so that the association has a lot of power, the Sangha. So thank you very much for 
for joining us today, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Prabhu. Dhanavad. Hare Krishna. Okay, anyone else? Uh, thank you, thank you, Prabhu, very much. Jai Mahayogi Prabhu ki jai. Gora Bhakta Vrinda ki jai. There's Seva Rupa Dasi of SA. What's SA? South America? South Africa. Huh? South Africa. Oh, South Africa. Okay. I, I, I lived at the temple in Johannesburg, South Africa, for about three months back in 1982 with uh, Bhakta Lu, who later became Lalit. Yeah, um... I can't remember his Brahmacharya, but now he's a sannyasi. You, you would know who that is. Anyways, yeah. And Yudhamanyu Prabhu. We were there with Yudhamanyu Prabhu and uh, some other sannyasis. What's his? I, I, I don't know his sannyas name off the top of my head, but you know who I'm talking about. He lived in San Jose. Anyways, hi. There's your baby. Hello. Good to see you. And tell them.